So, hello and welcome to my thesis defense uh, entitled uh, Local Modification and uh, Laser Welding Production of uh, Functionalized Microfluidic Chips. I will start by explaining the ceremony for those who are not aware of how it works. <clears throat> To your left, you'll find the opponents. Uh, they will be asking questions for about 45 minutes. And I will have to defend and uh, respond to those questions. Uh, to your right, you'll find my co-promoters and promoter, uh, plus the chair of this defense, representing the rector Magnificus of the University of Wageningen. Uh, to my right, uh, you'll find the RIGDEV. And to my left, you'll find the DJ. Those are my paranyms. The planning for this uh, defense, I am now doing the introduction talk, uh, the layman talk. Um, from 4.15 till 5, there will be a thesis defense where all the opponents are asking questions. Uh, then the committee will gather, and from then on, they, uh, they will tell me whether I got a PhD or not. Uh, from uh, 6 on to Tuesday, uh, we'll have a uh, reception or a party, if you will. So what exactly is a microfluidic chip? Uh, well, it's an entire lab in the palm of your hand, and it fits about between your index finger and your uh, thumb. Um, and for each of those channels, you can attribute a function. So one of those little guys on the hand there that's... Uh, that's one of the channels. So for instance, one channel can be uh, antibody detection of uh, malaria, for instance. Uh, while the other channel is uh, controlling temperature by flowing a hot liquid. Just trying to throw it out there. However, chemically speaking, each channel has one function. So that uh, kind of limits you if you actually uh, have a device that only is composed of one channel. So only one of those little guys will be there. So what we actually want to achieve is per channel, we want to have multiple functionalities, or at least a platform that allows us to achieve this. And in this case, you'd have a channel, and you go back to the situation of the entire lab in the palm of your hand. But combining surface chemistry with engineering, and we increase the number of uh, channels, and now we also have multiple functionalities per channel, then the complexity of your device can increase as well as much as you want. So that's kind of the idea. So, but to do this, we also have to understand how exactly are these chips typically fabricated. You take a piece of glass that has uh, sort of an indentation that has been etched, kind of like, it kind of looks like this if you zoom in. <clears throat> so, then you take the other piece of this, uh, glass substrate, or plastic in some cases, you put them together, you press them, and uh, you apply heat, and you melt the glass together and you create the device. So that's pretty much how they make them uh, most of the time. So our goal is to get localized functionalities inside a glass channel. So the easiest approach would be to get a channel from the previous slide, functionalize it, get the other half, bind it together, and that'll be done. But at 400 degrees, you kill pretty much most of the chemical functionalities. You, if you want to attach a bacteria there, it's done, dead. So in chapter five, and I start by the end, <laughs> Uh, we tried to achieve a low temperature uh, method that would allow us to do this uh, using laser. It has some promising results, but further work needs to be done. The other chapters uh, rely on an entirely different approach. We take already a closed channel, we activate the channel, and then we just use UV light and shades to pattern and locally modify the inside of the channels, and that will be covered in chapter two to four. So in chapter two, we take glass and we cover it with a, a molecule, uh, a silane, that has a moiety called uh, like SIH, that 
um, is very interesting because it reacts with light in the presence of alkenes and you can thus modify it. And if you use light, you can use shadows to pattern and attach molecules here and there. There was only one problem. Once we finally achieved this, we found a paper on JAX saying that it was not possible. So that implies a lot more work because you really have to prove that it's there. So not only did we prove that it's there, we published it and we even made a patent. So that's nice. Uh, the graphical abstract shows that we can use molecules uh, with certain hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic properties to actually steer water uh, and uh, they kind of function as tiny dikes that can steer big waves. But how big are these waves and how tiny are these dikes? And just for a sense of scale, this is an impossibly giant tsunami. It's about 100 kilometers high, uh, just on the outer boundary, a uh, space boundary. And the dike is about a global warming proof dike. I think 10 meters should be su sufficient. And that's pretty much it. It seems unrealistic, but that's kind of how it goes. You take water, you flow it, and these tiny dikes are indeed st steering big waves. And it goes up and down. So it, basically, you're making microfluidics inside microfluidics. It's sort of inception. In the bottom, you see a wall that has stopped uh, the water flow, and on the top, you see it stirring. It's almost like a kind of magic, where you, you might recognize this image from the back of the thesis. It's, it's very interesting. Um, but just playing with hydrophobicity and, and hydrophilicity is uh, just one of the aspects. It's uh, the, one of the simplest ones. By playing with the <coughs> properties of the SIH bond, we could modify the wavelength at which, at, the, at which it absorbs light. And thus, we increase the wavelength to just a tiny bit higher. And that allowed us to attach moieties that you can easily click other biological moieties onto, like, uh, say, DNA or even nanoparticles. So that was a very nice paper where we um, uh, attached a DNA enzyme that behaves as an enzyme. And we created a sort of biological reactor in uh, just a few steps. But we, then we, on chapter four, we transferred this uh, knowledge onto uh, the activation of uh, plastics. And these are so-called inert plastics, and they're used precisely because of that. But because of their inertness, you're not really able to functionalize them that easily. So we take COC, cyclic olefin copolymers, and there's pretty much just CH bonds in there. And there's not much you can do with them. But we found a method that in water, in 20 minutes at room temperature, you create mostly just alcohol functions. You can in improve that by modifying and tweaking some values, but uh, that's, it was, pr it was pretty, pretty close to alchemy when we were like, oh, this actually works. So by doing this, then we attached the chemistry from uh, chapter two and three, and we were able to pattern uh, these polymers. These polymers, despite being inert, <clears throat> Plastics are not very uh, uh, safe to use if you want to have an, uh, an organic solvent. They will sort of dissolve it uh, and damage it. It's not chemical, it's just physical. But it will damage the, the polymer. So the advantage of these coatings is that you can actually uh, protect the polymer. So in uh, chromatography applications, this could be very, very useful. And uh, here in green, you'll see where I apply the molecule. It's completely unaffected after, I think this was half an hour of uh, dichloromethane. While the unprotected area is completely damaged, you can, you can see uh, some cracks happening. In chapter five, as I mentioned before, we take glass that has been coated with uh, chromium, and uh, chromium absorbs very well on infrared. So basically we can then use a laser to heat locally uh, just around the channel and weld the glass together. Uh, and this should allow us to put molecules before the assembly 
and that's a lot faster and easier in a wafer scale on a bigger industrial scale. So we did have quite some positive results uh, in there, and uh, we did fabricate uh, quite a few slides, so that was very good. That would be chapter five. So all in all, the, uh, the Eiffel Tower being, we have a completely operational multiplex device that is able to perform all of these functions that I uh, mentioned before. We're not there yet. We're pretty much just here. But we did gain quite some knowledge in how to take it to the next step. And uh, I think off the, the tip of my finger, in about two years, we should be able to have an operational device. But we're still not there yet. So soon the defense will start. So please do not forget to put your phones in silence. Uh, and uh, hope you enjoy. Please be seated. I hereby open this ceremony convened by the Academic Board of Wageningen University, in which Ruri Pedro Rio da Costa Carvalho is offered the opportunity of defending a thesis with propositions entitled Local modification and laser welding production of functionalized microfluidic chips. The defense will take place before an examining committee appointed by the academic board as a prerequisite for conferring the degree of doctor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you all to this graduation. My name is Tini van Boekel, Dean of Education and member of the academic board. And in that capacity, I represent the Rector Magnificus today. I now call upon the first examiner, Professor Bitter, who is Professor of Bio-Based Chemistry and Technology at Wageningen University. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Respected uh, candidate, I uh, read your thesis with, uh, with great pleasure. It's an interesting uh, and broadly applicable uh, topic, uh, I guess, or I think and I believe. Uh, and that's, I think, also good for now because that also gives uh, ample room uh, for discussion. And the first uh, topic I'd like to discuss with you is on something you write in uh, your general discussion on page 110. In the second line of the, uh, from the top, you uh, say that you want to attach molecules at a specific location. And I'd like to know the word specific. How specific is specific in your case? or in your view? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your comments uh, regarding the thesis and uh, for your question. A uh, specific location here is, uh, if I understand your question correctly, uh, geographically inside a channel you can choose a specific location. Okay, so, that, that's, so specific means in this case on the length scale of um, micrometers? Um, I think, uh, the, as I can prove, uh, micrometers would be accurate. Lower than that, I cannot guarantee. And that's also then the interesting statement, you cannot guarantee. 
but apparently you have ideas about that. How far can we stretch this? Eh? If we want to attach molecules in channels or whatever, oh. what in your view, how, how, how far can we stretch this space-wise? I guess uh, theoretically uh, one could do it uh, by half of the wavelength of the light used, but experimentally I'm sure it should uh, be a lot higher. More difficult than that. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> um, then I'd like to go with you to, uh, to chapter four. And uh, I'd like to discuss a little bit on page uh, uh, 78, 79, uh, uh, scheme 4.1. Um, the title of the chapter is Mild and Selective CH Activation. What is, how do you define selective CH activation in this case? What is the selective part? Um, the selective part would be the function that it turns into uh, in the sense that we selectively modify it to an alcohol function. Okay, so it's not... But not, not, uh, not CH specific. Ah, that's too bad because I was hoping that you could, could enlighten me a little bit. How far can we stretch this? You make now alcohol functions eh, out of your, mm -hmm. in this case, polymer. Yeah. A, a holy grail always in chemistry is to make selectively methanol out of methane in one step. But eh? that's uh, where this chemistry is based on. I guess so. Uh, I, back in my master's, uh, I worked in a group in Portugal that did precisely this. Mm -hmm. And I figured, well, let's try it with this plastic. Yeah. And it worked. And it works. And, but I, if, can, can you give me a feeling, because it works in this case for this, this plastic, eh? mm -hmm. uh, and methane to methanol is a complete different ball game. Eh? The, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the amounts you're talking about are much more eh, if you want to make methanol. Mm -hmm. um, since you said uh, on your master thesis and uh, before you, you worked on that, mm -hmm. can you give me a feeling how far can we stretch this kind of chemistry now? Can we use it already to make bulk chemicals or is there still a long way to go? Um, if my memory serves me correctly, I believe the professor responsible for this sold the patent to the Chinese, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so? <laughs> so, I think it's possible, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I, I still, I am still interested, thank you for that, uh, I'm still interested in this, uh, in the CH activation. Uh, but I will come back to that in a, a second. Uh, can I ask one of your paranyms now to read proposition number eight? Most of research is learning on how not to perform an experiment. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, on how not to perform an experiment. Can you uh, discuss a little bit or show, uh, give me some, uh, an example on the CH activation, how not to perform it? Um, a very simple example would be um, this uh, reaction is made in an aqueous solution. Mm -hmm. So the problem is you see it doesn't really go inside the water, it floats. So you kind of have to watch the side that it's facing down or you just have to really submerge it. Mm -hmm. And you only learn this after realizing that this is not how you should do it. And what did you do now with this kind of experience and information? You just, uh, I guess it's an iterative process in that uh, every little mistake that you make or you figure out that it doesn't work, you try and correct it and step by step you optimize every single process. But how should I learn about this then? I mean, it's not all in here, is it? Um, so what, nah, this specific well, I, example I, maybe. This specific example, I, uh, I do mention submersion. So, but in general, hey, if I look a little bit more general, because these statements are more general, what should we do with this kind of information, to your um, opinion? I guess submit to the journal with reproducible results. <laughs> that yeah, could well. be one. Uh, no, but uh, I believe that um, um, there's too much of a focus in uh, publishing uh, things that work perfectly. Mm -hmm. And uh, in uh, my chapter two, um, actually, I mentioned that we did try other silanes yeah. uh, and how they were not, not optimal. So I think it's very added value information to mention uh, reactions that did not work, that you thought they would work. 
So should we, how, how should we publish that? And you mentioned the irreproducible results. That's huh? half a joke, half serious yeah. remark. It's very, but, uh, yeah. But what, what, what should we do in your opinion? Um, either a comment uh, if it's uh, mm -hmm. minor in the paper or perhaps even the supporting info. Okay, yeah. Good. I would say. Yeah, yeah well, that would be a good suggestion, I, I think. Is there still time for a question, uh, Mr. Ecker? Okay. Then I want to ask you a little bit more detailed uh, question on um, Chapter 4, on Figure 4.1 and Figure 4.2. With these two figures, eh, the one is infrared ah. and the other one is XPS, yeah. uh, you, you, I guess you try to convince me that your method eh, of oxidation and then the sodium boron hydride method after that gives you one type of OH groups. Eh? That's at least that's what I guess uh, figure 4.2 in the XPS shows. Mm -hmm. But if I look at the infrared for the same sample, I have the impression that there are still two OH groups present. At least the blue um, you, top you, you say one type of OH? I, well, would, I would say one type of oxygen. I have no idea about the types of OH in there. I think it's very hard to distinguish between uh, secondary and tertiary alcohols, for instance. And, uh, so how should I then read uh, figure 4.2? Huh? Let's focus on line D there, yes. where you write C, O, H, and then you underline the O. Uh, so it's there. Yeah. Unspecified what's attached to the C? So basically that figure shows uh, the reduction of the remaining uh, carbonyls into alcohols. But uh, the clearly wider full width half maximum shows a greater variety on oh, the types okay. of OH. Okay, I understand. Okay. That, Thank that, that would be how I interpret it. Okay, good. Thank you very much. And herewith I give the word back to the rector. Thank you, Professor Bitter. The opposition will be continued by the second opponent, Professor Suthalter, who is Professor of Organic Materials and Interfaces at Delft University of Technology. The floor is yours. Thank you, well, uh, Mr. Director. Dear uh, candidate, I've read your thesis with interest, and I want to compliment you with the results you have obtained in such a short time. My special interest was attracted also to your chapter four, on the CH activation of cyclic olefin copolymers, COCs, in your uh, microfluidic channels. For this uh, activation, you uh, have investigated hydrogen peroxide in combination with copper 2 acetate. The copper 2 acetate was shown to be essential for the reaction, as I understood from your thesis. Can you explain to me the reaction mechanism? of the reaction between the COC polymer and that mixture. Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your comments and your question. Uh, the mechanism, uh, I do not recall if I wrote it up, I think I perhaps wrote it in terms of text, but um, the copper two reacts with the hydrogen peroxide to form a pero copper peroxo complex that then uh, abstracts one uh, hydrogen from carbon and uh, any water in the vicinity will, and even the, from the peroxide itself uh, will react. There, the, the mechanism itself uh, is a bit uh, dis disputed in literature, depending on uh, which school of thought you come from, in a sense. Uh, in, the, in the Russian side with uh, Pro Professor Shulpin, this is the assumption. But uh, in uh, Spain with uh, Professor Garcia, uh, the mechanism is uh, uh, postulated to be uh, via different routes. So, it's and that, that role of copper, how to see that exactly? Is that then involved in a redox reaction? Yes. Uh, it, it is not the most efficient of catalysts. Um, the turnover number uh, for, some, for most of the complexes is below 100, uh, f based on uh, solution analogs. 
but I did not perform this kind of tests uh, on this uh, mm -hmm. particular system. Uh, but it is indeed a, a, a redox uh, reaction. Okay. So, and then you are forming an uh, hydroxide. Uh, yeah, co co copper, uh, copper hydroxide. Or H -O -O dot, I think. Copper huh? oxide, copper hydroxide, they're, they're both uh, formed. Uh, you can uh, detect them on XPS if you do not uh, wash your samples. Mm -hmm. Um, you do see the peak at uh, lower uh, binding energies. Mm -hmm. um, so that species is indeed formed. Yeah. Um, so that is an, a radical species, and that radical species so detects abstract. the COC, yeah. abstracting also a an hydrogen and, and, uh, atom or, uh, it or a cation. What, what happens? Uh, the radical species abstracts the hydrogen, forms a, a carbon center radical. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, the, I would say, the initiation mechanism yeah. from the COC perspective. Yeah. yeah. And then you also expect a certain, I would say, molecular specification, huh, because you have different types yes. of CH groups. Uh, there is uh, some uh, um, substitution level uh, specificity yeah. in solution analogs. Yeah. What do you uh, expect from theory? What? So... Um, I would say that uh, the more substituted carbons most likely will form a radical more easily yes, since it will be more uh, substituted, more stabilized. I'm not sure. Uh, that's all, always debatable with radicals. Okay. Uh, they can if always I look, go for instance, to your cartoon at the start of your uh, chapter oh, yeah. four, then yeah, you give several positions. Hey, you indicate three possible positions of the OH groups. Yes. Has that uh, a meaning or is that just a cartoon? It's just a cartoon. Oh, okay. Yeah, unfortunately, um, with uh, the current studies, I would say it's not very uh, credible to okay. uh, determine the position of the OH group. Okay, because I was a little bit surprised when I saw that cartoon that none of the hydrogens of your norbonine part, huh? so the bicyclic The structure. norbonine actually should have, yeah, indeed. Also, huh? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. In fact, um, in one of the references, um, in, uh, if you take COC and you put it in uh, oxygen plasma conditions, mm -hmm. the more norbonine content, the higher the carboxylic acids, actually. Pardon? I missed the plasma. Um, the higher the norbonine content of the COC, yeah in uh, oxygen plasma, the yeah. higher the amount of uh, uh, carboxylic okay. uh, type species. So I would say indeed that uh, overoxidation tends to happen on the norbonine mm -hmm. area. Yeah, yeah. Do we have some idea? What's the reason for that? Um, yeah, because you can count maybe the primary, the secondary and the tertiary carbon atoms and yeah, I'll say preference, it's, huh, for it's all very educated and guesses then here. Should fit, huh? Yeah. So in end, I, uh, indeed. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, now, after that uh, successful introduction of these uh, surface OH groups, in the way you have described, I was also wondering what is now the surface density of the OH groups? How hydrophilic has the polymer become? Do you have any idea what the density is of OH groups on your surface? Mm. I would say it's quite low. It's uh, quite low. Can yeah. you give a number? Yeah. Uh, lower than 100% for sure. No. Yeah, but <laughs> let's say in uh, terms of structures, we count, let's say, an area of square nanometers. Uh, I do not think I can precise that. I think in, uh, if you look at content angles, you get an indication of perhaps the level of uh, um, modification. Yeah. If you take uh, activated COC on plasma, you, you tend to get around 44 degrees. 44 it, degrees for the water contact angle. Water static contact angle. Okay. Um, and if you reduce it with uh, sodium borohydride, then this was uh, discovered uh, after the publication, so it's not included in the thesis. Um, you get around 60 degrees, which is similar to polyvinyl alcohol at 99% hydrolysis. So you could somehow... That goes in the wrong direction, I would say. If you had 44 and you go it, to 60, by the reduction of carbonyls to OH, I would say it would be lower than 44. But and, um, how is that possible? I would argue that polymers are strange. 
Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> That's not convincing. No, no, no. no, no. The, 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 the point here uh, um, is that uh, hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity uh, is, depends uh, a lot on, uh, on polymers. It depends a lot on in which solvent they're contacting on. So you can... But you have experience. Huh? You did the reaction. You had OH yes, groups. Yes. It's 44. Then you do a further reduction. So you increase the number of OH groups. Yes. And you go up to 60. And I think that's strange. Um, yeah. <sighs> I guess... I guess um, it, it also depends on the arrangement on the surface uh, and uh, the level of uh, local uh, roughness. Mm -hmm. So I'm not entirely sure whether the processes I've mm -hmm. made made either the surface smoother or uh, uh, rougher. Mm -hmm. So that could also be explained the reason mm -hmm. why they increase contact angle. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is, the contact angles that I've mentioned in this particular process of the copper are around 70 to mm -hmm. 86. Mm -hmm. So they're extremely higher. So I would say they're not that, uh, they're ends lower than 100%. Uh, okay. uh, but Still a problem to be solved, I would say. Pardon? Still a problem to be solved. Um, I think uh, the reactions yield can be improved by using a, a more effective catalyst mm -hmm. or by introducing nitric acid, which mm -hmm. uh, in, it's known to improve the yield mm -hmm. in solution analogs. So that could be an hypothesis, okay. yeah, okay. for improvement. I think I have to stop here. Okay, thank you very much for having a discussion with you from this position. Geef ik graag het woord weer terug aan de rector. Thank you, Professor Sutholter. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Legak, who is associate professor at the University of Twente in Enschede. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Director. Uh, dear candidate, I also would like to congratulate you with your thesis. I read it with uh, great pleasure. And I also would like to congratulate you for the choice of your pictures on page uh, 4 and 121. And regarding uh, the picture on page four, I would like to tell you that the translation is not correct because you say it's a duck, but I can confirm it's a goose and it's written on it. <laughs> so uh, now I would like to uh, continue the opposition and I would like to uh, discuss in particular chapter five with you and the bonding of the microfluidic uh, device. And the first question I would like to ask you, so you're working with a welding approach to bond your microfluidic device. And I would like to ask you to explain me how it works, because I have not fully understood how it works. So how does that work? Uh, highly esteemed opponent. Uh, thank you for your comments and uh, your correction. Uh, regarding your question, um, which page was it again? Um, it's about the welding. Um, the welding procedure. Welding procedure. So how does that work? Uh, do you have any particular point that you like, or would you like me to go through the entire process? Yeah, uh, shortly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the chromium is used as a, a mask already on, a, on glass uh, when you etch the channels. But in this case, instead of just stripping away the chromium and then do fusion bonding, you just leave it there. And since uh, chromium absorbs uh, very well in IR, um, we use uh, an infrared laser to uh, locally heat the chromium to, so that it locally welds the, upon contact with another substrate under But what pressure. do you mean by locally, actually? Because you have your masking layer everywhere between your two glass substrates. Uh -huh. uh, so are well, you scanning the whole substrate, actually, with a laser, or do you do yes, that Yes, precisely. Certain? The laser goes around at a certain uh, speed. So you don't scan the whole surface of your device? No, just uh, around the, the laser welding area. So you, okay, you define a, a, uh -huh. a weld seam, and the laser goes and uh, locally heats it, and it creates a joint that binds the substrates together. So you just bind locally, actually, your two substrates. You don't have, like, a full... No, 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 no. Yeah. Not entirely, no. Okay, um, so that was not clear to me, yeah. Okay. But uh, uh, the, the weld is strong enough that if you apply uh, the crack opening test with a blade, it stops at the weld seam. So uh, from then on, you can consider it 
bonded. Yeah. And how, does, how much time does it take typically to bond one device? Uh, not much, I would say uh, less than a minute. Less than one minute, yeah. uh, so it would be applicable actually for industrial purposes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would say yeah. so. Okay, so I would like to uh, continue actually about this chapter and here you uh, say that eventually maybe you have biomolecules immobilized in your channel mm -hmm. and as a model for biomolecules you're using fluorescein. Do you think it's a good model actually? Uh, looking back, I probably could have found a better one. So which one would you have used then? Um, um, I could have used, uh, uh, let me think, some, uh, something a bit more biological, say DNA, that is DNA? A, that has a fluor force. Uh, uh, but again, uh, it, it all depends on the nature of the fluorophore and the thermal stability. So uh, fluorescein, um, told us that the process is actually quite exothermic uh, in, the, in a range that is not yet suitable with, mm -hmm. this, with this particular laser. But with other lasers, perhaps, we, uh, and some of the results indicate that uh, this, this is possible. But with this... Yeah, but uh, one could argue that your channels are rather broad, yeah? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. So you could either go for a better laser or make wider channels or just uh, increase the distance of the weld seam. There's yeah. quite a lot. But going back to the idea of using a better model, let's say more like a biomolecule, mm -hmm. yeah? So what would happen? So you say DNA, yeah? DNA uh, would be a one, but what else could you use, yeah? Um, and what happens actually if you heat the temperature? If you take some DNA and you heat the temperature? If you have double-stranded DNA? Uh, I guess it uh, dehybridizes, uh, yeah. so uh, and uh, would lose the properties uh, that it has. Um, <clears throat> another model, for instance, one that would be extremely radical, would be to just uh, actually attach living uh, cells, what, uh? living cells. Oh. That would yeah. be an extremely radical one. If and if that would work, then the system would be perfect. So th that would be the other uh, side of the spectrum. Oh. In terms and of, in terms of protein, for instance, what happens if I increase my temperature and I have a protein? I guess it denaturates and yeah. then loses again its properties. So, so you, I think you could still do something with fluorescence and play with biomolecules, like if you immobilize GFP, it denaturates and then yeah, you yeah, also yeah, lose for sure, the fluorescence. For sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, it, it, it all depends on uh, how you want to probe the, the temperature. Oof and uh, visual methods such as fluorescence are the easiest ones, I guess. Mm. Then I have another question. So the main issue actually with this technique is that you have a temperature increase in your channel. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to systematically characterize actually this uh, temperature gradient you would have in your channels? Yeah, we were looking at using thermocouples, but thermocouples give more of an average. It's not a very good uh, one. Uh, thermal cameras uh, were being um, thought on, mm. but uh, they also imply quite a heavy investment. Um, Unless they are available in the lab, yeah. <laughs> if they are available as well, yeah, of course. <clears throat> um, so considering the time constraint, uh, this was the method that we went for. But uh, for sure we could have evaluated the gradient, the temperature gradient by using other methods. Yeah, so an infrared camera, yeah. yeah. Infrared camera would be, was one of the first go-to, but uh, again, you have to balance time and budget, and, uh, and uh, you just make a choice that works. Yep. Then in your discussion, you say that, okay, if you want to, uh, let's say, solve some of these temperature increase uh, issues, you could use a smaller laser, you know, a laser, mm -hmm. a laser With beam. A lower, but actually, yeah. I've been looking, but what is actually the spot size of your laser? Uh, if I recall, I couldn't find it, but uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, or maybe in the, supplementary the diameter of the beam at the focal point is approximately eight micrometers. Eight micrometers, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's uh, quite big. Yeah. And then, so in terms of um, applications, so multiple uh, places, you say that uh, you would like to. Uh, use some of the techniques you have developed for organ and chip applications, yeah? Mm -hmm. So going back to your uh, bonding technique, could you uh, foresee any issue actually if you want to grow cells in your channels or if you want to do an organ and chip platform? Um, 
Um, let me see if I understand the question correctly. You're asking me um, if, um, if I put cells in a channel and yeah. then apply this laser technique. No, 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 you, you fabricate your device, uh -huh. it's bonded, and okay. then you take it and you want to grow cells in your device. Oh, actually, I was. Uh, 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 that's a cool question because I uh, was. <laughs> I was thinking of uh, using uh, such a system where I would have a channel and uh, I would apply uh, uh, an anti-biofouling hydrophobic uh, pathway in the middle, and a fouling hydrophilic uh, pathway on the sides, and I would flow uh, lung cells, for instance, mm -hmm. and they would start. Attaching on the sides and grow there, while in on the middle not, and that could be a very easy way of fabricating a lung on a chip. Oh, yeah. No, my question was uh, oh. with respect to the bonding technique. Oh, the so, laser welding. Yeah. I I. Do you think it would be an issue to grow cells in your device? Perhaps the chromium could be a bit poisonous. I think so, yeah. Yes. Maybe, yeah. 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 So that's something you would So, But if you apply the chemistry from chapter two, then it becomes yeah, a silane, so perhaps you prevent that. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> I'm satisfied. Thank you, Mr. Director. Thank you, Dr. Lecoq. The opposition will be continued by the fourth examiner, Dr. Sprakel, who is associate professor at the Physical Chemistry and Softmatic Group of Wageningen University. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rector. <clears throat> Respected candidate, I also read your thesis with uh, pleasure. <clears throat> and what struck me in particular is the enigmatic feeling some of your statements uh, have. And I think your attire today contributes to this feeling of magic. Um, so I would like to challenge you on this a little bit, not on your attire, but on the enigmatic statements in your thesis. So I would like to uh, discuss with you the alpha and the omega of your thesis. And the first thing I saw when I opened it was Proposition number one, so I would like to ask you to ask one of the paronyms to read proposition one. The tangible can steer, the intangible can steer the tangible. Thank you. <clears throat> now this sounds like a philosophical uh, creed, but you refer for this uh, statement to your thesis. And uh, this is rather tangible, and this is what we have been asked to evaluate. Um, but maybe you can tell me what is the intangible that we do not see that steered this thesis? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, regarding the intangible, uh, it is a bit tongue-in-cheek, and uh, the intangibility here would be perceived as the light that we use to modify the surface that then steers the water. But yeah, one could also think of ideas they are intangible and they steer people which are the tangible. Yeah, so indeed, double edge there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So then if I go all the way to the end of your thesis, and I'm not referring to the uh, homage to MacGyver that I see there all the way at the end, um, but I'm referring to the last bit of science and a statement, which is a, a picture of the Eiffel Tower mm -hmm. and uh, various stages of completion. And you draw an analogy between science, or more particular, the microfluidic field, and the building of the Eiffel Tower, and you tell us we are here, midway to the Eiffel Tower. So when you go to the top of the real Eiffel Tower, you see a nice view of Paris and a rather overpriced restaurant. What do we find when the Eiffel Tower of microfluidics is finished? Um, I'll ask him the point. Um, I have never been to Paris. Uh, I have been to the airport Charles de Gaulle, though, but I have Good said you. hello. Um, the full constructed Eiffel Tower uh, would represent uh, the goal of the, that was presented in the beginning of the thesis. Um, and we built this chemistry on the foundations of others. So, and we took it yet another step. <clears throat> but as we are now, we're nowhere close to the full construction. But we are getting there. And uh, we just set up the, the stage for the next person to just build upon it. What so, do, will they view from there? It would be a fully multiplexed uh, microfluidic device 
that can do multiple detections of uh, antigens or ultimately it, uh, and, it limits his imagination. And what happens then? So a building is something that has a clear start and ending and you use this as an analogy to describe science. So what happens if it's done? Do we all go home and find no, another we, job? We, we build another Eiffel Tower. Okay. <laughs> okay. And what will that Eiffel Tower be? Uh, oh, what would that be? I guess um, if we achieve uh, uh, the ability to go to space uh, as a humanity, um, I could say we get a tricorder, for instance, from a Star Trek. Okay, so <clears throat> although I would love to have a 10 minute discussion with you about that, uh, let's, let's move <laughs> on to something a bit more tangible. Um, so, you use big words in your thesis, and I appreciate that, but that also uh, triggers uh, uh, me to challenge you on this. Huh? And mm -hmm. you use words like holy grail, and that sets a rather high level of ambition. Yes. And um, your whole thesis is about specifically putting molecules on some specific spot in a microchip, and one example that I could find where you use this is where you put a DNA zyme confined to a specific portion of a chip, and you show that it can uh, um, process substrates. But if I look at that experiment, could you have not done exactly the same experiment if the DNA zyme would have been everywhere in the chip? Uh, I agree, and would have uh, performed twice as better. It was more of a proof of concept. Um, so the holy grail, however, was related to the COC chemistry. But um, the, so, the so time can you give me then uh, one specific example, because I have not been able to find this in your thesis, mm -hmm. where this patterning would really be crucial to do the job that you want the chip to do? Uh, for instance, um, in the thesis uh, I mentioned uh, the, the, the water being steered by hydrophobicity and uh, even stopped. And, um, a lot of uh, passive valving relies on um, intricate uh, 3D construction, which is uh, time consuming on an engineering perspective, or even depends on uh, active uh, actuators. And um, by using this chemistry, uh, one surpasses that obstacle. Okay, but I want to go back to this catalysis idea. So okay. you write at some point that spatial patterning would be crucial, and at another point you write spatial patterning would be highly advantageous for inflow biocatalysis. Uh, so can you give me an example of a catalytic process which would be better if you do it on chip, uh, and which you could only do when you do spatial patterning? Um, yeah, the, for instance, uh, an oxidative cascade uh, where you require a, a specific sequence of chemicals for uh, the oxidation to proceed, whether it, if you flow in the other direction, then you don't. And so I, I completely agree with you. This is the only thing I could come up with that, that would really prove that this is crucial. So why did you not do this? Uh, time. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, so um, I also want to ask you a short question about uh, chapter four about these plastics, and you just said that polymers are strange. This is a dangerous statement with a polymer guy in your committee, <laughs> but I'll let that slide for now. Um, <clears throat> you use this uh, method, which I understand is quite a unique way to activate these uh, carbon bonds. Um, but are there not other ways to make these plastic devices active towards sign lanes? Um, yeah, you could use uh, plasma activation, corona activation. But other than physically damaging the polymer? And they also require an open surface. Um, you could use, uh, for instance, um, activation by uh, benzophenone, which uh, the ketyl radical abstracts in a proton from the surface. Uh, but that also introduces uh, uh, these uh, benzophenone moiety, <clears throat> and um, and you don't really get monolayers uh, because it's a, it's a solution based uh, method in the sense that if the radicals come from solution, the probability to create multilayers is a lot higher. 
But, but other than trying to abstract something from the material that's already there to make it reactive, could you add something to or onto the material? I guess you could just simply coat it with something that is uh, uh, reactive. Uh, like, for instance, uh, a light-sensitive polymer. But will that be covalently bound to the COC? No. So that is a perfect setup to my last question. So, you know, I'm not a organic chemist, I'm a physical chemist, mm -hmm. and we prefer non-covalent bonds over covalent ones. So are there not ways to do this without covalent chemistry, to put something on that surface, to get some functionality or uh, resistance to solvents? Um, yeah, I guess one can think of ways of doing that, yes. Um, uh, you could uh, coat them uh, completely with a fluorinated uh, polymer and that will give it uh, a solvent protection. And I think that's even published. Um, and, and what would be the advantage of doing that over using covalent chemistry? Of course, I'm now trying to sell my own field to you. <clears throat> um, longevity of the device. If, um, unless the coating is really thick enough, uh, if it's not covalently bound, it can, uh, it, it becomes a sort of a flying carpet. Would it also not just be easier to flow something in that sticks by itself? Um, would you be able to localize it? That's also another question. Good point. Okay. With that, I would like to give the word back to the director. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sprakel. The opposition will be continued from this side of the auditorium. I'd like to give the floor to one of the co-promoters, Dr. Pujari, who is research associate at the Laboratory of Organic Chemistry of Wageningen University. Thank you, Rector. Uh, respected candidate, uh, it's great interest to read your thesis, and which is shows highly applicable in both the fundamental and industrial application. Uh, also, I have a few questions about the in chapter two and three. You have shown about the DFT calculation to dissociation energy of the, the silicon hydrogen bond. And uh, there, there you find out that the dissociation energy by DFT is around uh, 3.6 in that range. And by, theory, by experimental, you found a little bit higher. Okay, the main question is here, is it, uh, do you find the exactly distance between the, the UV lamp and your surface? What is the is there distance you have to measure, or is it matters a lot? <clears throat> uh, highly esteemed promoter, uh, uh, thank you for your uh, several questions, actually. Um, so the difference between the calculated SIH bond, dissociation, bond, uh, dissociation bonding energy uh, and uh, experimental uh, difference that's uh, the flaw of every model that you try to compare with reality. It just gives you an indication of what's going on. There will always be some uh, differences. <clears throat> Regarding the distance um, from the lamp to the surface, um, indeed the distance is very crucial, especially if it is uh, G-light lamps. The, the lamps are not collimated, their, uh, their uh, spectral uh, signature is uh, quite broad. And uh, the, the distance, uh, the wattage per square centimeter um, relies a lot on the distance from the lamp as well. So uh, more than uh, one inch and the, you start losing by a lot. Is there any way to calculate the en energy from one millimeter to until one centimeter? Better than calculate, I would measure it with uh, an actual uh, uh, device. Mm -hmm. um, but to calculate, um, I <clears throat> to calculate the loss of energy from the lamp onto the yeah. surface. Yes. Um, I guess it would be uh, one over R square, or something of the kind, uh, and uh, times a constant that will have to be determined experimentally. It's not that easy to get the exact number uh, that uh, bond dissociation energy of the silicon hydrogen. Oh, that would be uh, another 
question. Uh, the dissociation energy of the, can be perhaps estimated by uh, using a UVV spectrophotometer uh, by um, uh, taking the trichlorosilane and reacting it with water, which would uh, create small little nanoparticles that would sort of resemble the edge glass and measure the UVVs and see where the absorption is. But I only thought of it now, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, yeah, and uh, I have one more question about the, in chapter five, about laser welding. Mm -hmm. in, uh, if you see the figure 5.4, that graph about the 5.4, the, you see the distance until zero to 500, there is no intense uh, fluorescence intensity from zero distance to until 500 micrometer. And uh, you use eight micrometer, uh, this laser, laser spot. Mm -hmm. uh, and also you use the FITC as a indicator to see that how much you damage the, these monolayers. The, why you use the FITC here? Um, mostly due to availability. We add it, we use it. And uh, heat propagation uh, depends a lot on the, on the substrates. And in this case, it's uh, as big as the graph shows it. Um, so that would be my, my quick answer. It's easy to bleach, right? I'm afraid we have to stop the discussion here. I now adjourn the meeting. The examining committee will withdraw for consultation.
Please be seated. I hereby reopen this meeting. The Academic Board of Wageningen University, represented by the Deputy Rector Magnificus and seven committee members appointed by the Academic Board, having noted the content of a thesis entitled Local Modification and Laser Welding Production of Functionalized Microfluidic Chips with propositions, having heard the defense of that thesis, has decided to confer the degree of doctor on Rui Pedro Rio da Costa Carvalho, born in Veras e São Jurau da Barra, Portugal, on January 18, 1985, and to grant him all rights and privileges ensuing from that doctorate by law and custom. The Academic Board assumes that you accept your duty as a scientist to execute your future research ethically and with due diligence according to the Netherlands Code of Conduct for Good Scientific Practice. I now invite the promoter, Professor Zuiloff, to acquit himself of his duty. You have heard the decision of the Academic Board of Wageningen University to, to confer on you Rui Pedro Rijo da Costa Carvalho, the degree of doctor. It is now my honor to present you with a degree signed by the rector Magnificus, the promoter and the co-promoters, and sealed with the great seal of Wageningen University. I first invite you to sign the degree as well. And with this signature, you declare to act according to the scientific code of conduct in the future. Please allow me, Mr. Deputy Rector Magnificus, to offer my congratulations and to add a personal address. Dear Dr. Carvalho, dear Rui, many, many congratulations with the obtained result. And I'd like to extend these congratulations to all that you hold dear, your partner Adriana, your family, friends of many nationalities, paranymphs, present and past colleagues. Now, no PhD project is alike, but with a variation to a well-known saying, some are even more different than others. 
In the summer of 2015, you had finished 47 months of a total of a 48 months project when you suddenly had to change both topic and supervisor. This was, to say it mildly, a pretty difficult situation for you. But via the intervention of the graduate school Flach and Raul Bino, you ended up at ORC. And there, you, Sidhu, Marco and Alvin from Micronit and I had to quickly devise an alternative PhD project, which should yield you three research chapters in 12 months. And due to inventiveness, hard work, but also to the regained ability to laugh, we actually managed. And this is no small feat, so it's worth repeating. Three first author papers on a new topic in 12 months. It's quite something, and you did it. During this period, it also appeared that the initially proposed fourth paper would not be available in time. So we also had to come up with a fourth paper. Since by that time you were evidently on a roll, you managed. So in total, 18 months of work yielded you four first author papers, one co-authorship, actually together with your paronyms in Angewandte, and two first author patents, and a job at Surfix. Whoever thinks miracles do not happen should actually talk to you. I think this is because you aim high, actually very high, namely for the stars. You're actually the only graduate student who, with whom I ended up in my backyard at midnight, staring upwards and feeling small amongst such beautiful objects in the sky. Those objects can tell us quite a few things. The first is that beauty is literally all around us. It's just waiting to be seen. And secondly, there's no rush in attaining it. Nearly all of these phenomena will be there next year. A proper enjoyment thereof requires at least seven things. Patience, endurance, precision, training, attention, laughter, and knowledge. But in the cyclic nature of astronomy, is given that you do not only need them to be able to do it, but actually it also provides them to you while doing it. If you put these in a string, patience, endurance, precision, training, attention, laughter, and knowledge, they actually form the word, the word pep talk. And this is actually what nicely observations often provide, even without words. In many respects, you gave me when we started the impression of a gemstone that needed some cleaning and polishing. In the last two years, I've witnessed quite a lot of that. While the word polished would actually still be quite an exaggeration to be using for you, more and more I've seen that you start to glitter, and apart from only radiating the light of others, you are more and more radiant yourself. Now, before any one of you would draw from this the conclusion that I think that Rui is slowly turning into a star, I might actually remind you that Rui, of all people, is too aware that, all too aware that those stars that shine very brightly in a very short time live short and end up explosively. While on the other hand of the spectrum, you have the so-called brown dwarfs. Now, I also do not want to compare you to that. Dear Rui, I just, just hope uh, that you will be able to walk the fine middle line, the narrow path to a stable future with room to breathe and shine for you and all that you hold dear, both inside and outside of science. Finally, I'd also like to thank Elwin and Marco of Micronit for their unwavering support and input, uh, without which we would not have been here, and also Sidhu, for his tremendous roles as initiator, propagator, and catalyst altogether. It was a, really a joy to be able to work with the three of you and to see together the various elements of this thesis literally grow. With that, I'd like to wrap up and congratulate you once again. Thank you, Professor Zaylov. Dear Dr. Da Costa Carvalho, it is also my pleasure an honor to be able to congratulate you with your just obtained title and I would like to include your parents, your sister and your partner as well with this achievement. I'm sure they are very proud of you, uh, so are we as university because you have uh, contributed to uh, 
our motto for quality of life, explore the potential of nature. And that's something that you did at a very uh, small level, seeing how um, molecules behave. Uh, and uh, I think that that is very fundamental research that is needed for the application that Wageningen is, uh, is after to reach science for impact. So I'd like to thank you for your uh, contribution. Muito obrigado. Um, you are continuing in the Netherlands, so you're still going to miss Portugal, I, I guess. Um, but apparently you find also uh, a nice life over here. And you start, uh, or you continue actually as a researcher uh, to work on a, on a patent, but probably also some other scientific discoveries. And I'd like to wish you lots of success with that. And I hope that you will also uh, remain connected to uh, Wageningen University uh, as, uh, as an alumnus. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, committee for their time and effort spent on judging the thesis. It's much appreciated that uh, you took the time to do that. It helps us to, uh, to keep the level of our uh, thesis uh, on, a, on a good level. Especially like to thank uh, Dr. Legac and Professor Suthalter for coming to Wageningen, but of course also our own professors, Dr. Sprakel and Professor Bitter. Uh, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for being present here today to witness uh, this graduation. It's much appreciated. And finally, uh, Dr. Da Costa Cavalio, my last word is for you. One, congratulations once again, and I wish you a very pleasant day and lots of success in your future career. And with that, I close this session. Excuse me, everyone, a quick announcement. Uh, formal and informal congratulations to Hui would take place at H41 after 6 o'clock. Thank you very much. Laptop scanning, no? No, you can.